Hi everyone. In this lecture, we will have an overview of the different DNA sequencing techniques. Now, what is DNA sequencing? This is the process of determining the sequence or order of base pairs in a given molecule of DNA. As a recap, there are four bases in your DNA, and these are adenine, abbreviated by A, cytosine, which is abbreviated by C, guanine, which is abbreviated by G, and thymine, which is abbreviated by T. In this example, you can see the sequence of the 16S rRNA gene in E. coli, and you can see there are about 1,500 base pairs. And we know this sequence because of DNA sequencing. So why do we need to know the sequence of DNA or certain genes? Here are just some applications. First, it can help us detect mutations in specific genes of interest. In this example, you can see that this gene is composed of around 1,500 bases. But just change to one of these bases can lead to malfunction of the gene and even detrimental effects to an individual. Next, knowing the sequence of a specific gene can help us distinguish one organism from another. This is especially useful in identifying microorganisms which can be differentiated from each other by looking at specific differences in universal genes, like in this example, the 16S rRNA gene. It can also be used to help us identify human haplotypes and designate polymorphisms. This gives us information on how genes are inherited and how these variations might affect a gene's function. Now let's go into the different types of DNA sequencing techniques. The first grouping of DNA sequencing is called direct sequencing. And here there are two examples, the Maxim-Gilbert sequencing and Sanger sequencing. So what is direct sequencing? This is the most definitive molecular method to identify genetic lesions and to know the sequence of DNA. Here, the base sequences are read directly, and usually direct sequencing methods involve some sort of electrophoresis in which you can visualize bands that correspond to whatever base is in the sequence. This is especially useful in detecting small variations in a specific sequence. The first type of sequencing we have is called chemical sequencing, or Maxim-Gilbert sequencing. This type of technique requires single-stranded DNA or double-stranded DNA with a radioactive label at one end. Usually, this is the 5' prime end. This type of sequencing is called chemical sequencing because it uses chemical agents to cleave DNA at specific base pairs. Different fragments are then separated based on size to identify the sequence. The first step in chemical sequencing is the addition of a radioactive label. The label being used is a radioactive phosphorus, and usually this is conjugated to ATP. This is added to the 5' prime end of a DNA fragment using your polynucleotide kinase enzyme. If you wanted to add this radioactive phosphorus to the 3' prime end, the usual method is by using terminal transferase plus alkaline hydrolysis to remove excess adenylic acid residues. In this figure, you can see that you take our template DNA, and after this step, they will now be labeled with a radioactive label. Now, the radioactive label here is very important in order for us to visualize the DNA fragments later on. The next step is to use chemical agents to break apart the fragment. So our template DNA, which has already been labeled, is divided into four. Each aliquot is treated with a different chemical, and there are four being used. First, we have dimethyl sulfate, abbreviated by DMS, formic acid, which is abbreviated by FA, hydrazine, which is abbreviated by H, and a combination of hydrazine and a salt, abbreviated here with H plus S. In this figure, you can see are four tubes, each containing one of our different chemical agents. So we add our template DNA to each tube and incubate it for a period of time. Then, a strong reducing agent, such as 10% piperidine, is added, which breaks the strand at specific nucleotides. What you are left with is different fragments of different sizes, 
each ending in a specific nucleotide depending on which compound or which chemical it was incubated with. In this table, we can see the different chemical agents or base modifiers being used in chemical sequencing. So these base modifiers break apart your DNA fragment at specific nucleotides, and it does these using these different actions. We can also see here the time it takes or the incubation time for each of these base modifiers to completely break apart your template DNA. So first we have dimethyl sulfate or DMS, and this breaks the DNA fragment whenever it encounters a guanine. Formic acid breaks apart the DNA fragment whenever it encounters a guanine and an adenine. Then we have hydrazine, which breaks apart the chain whenever it encounters a thymine and a cytosine. And we have hydrazine salt, which breaks apart the chain whenever it encounters a cytosine. The last step in chemical sequencing is the separation of different fragments and the reading of the sequence. In the previous step, we are left with different fragments, and depending on the chemical agents being used, we are sure that these fragments end in a certain nucleotide. Now these fragments are loaded into a gel and separated based on their size using electrophoresis. The different fragments are separated by size on a denaturing polyacrylamide gel by electrophoresis. The radioactive label, which was added in step one, is used to visualize the bands, either using autoradiography or by exposing the gel to an X-ray film. The sequence is read from the bottom to the top, and this is from the five prime end all the way to the three prime end. In this figure, you can see an example of a gel being used in chemical sequencing. So at the bottom, you will find the shortest fragments, and this is closer to the five prime end. This is a recap, we added the primer in the five prime end. Okay, and in the top, here you have much longer fragments. Now the lane in which the band appears is used to identify the nucleotide. So for example, if you have a band in the G and the G plus A lane, then the nucleotide in that sequence is a guanine. If you have a band both in the C plus T lane and the C lane, then the nucleotide is a cytosine. If you have a band only in the C plus T lane, the nucleotide is a thymine. And if you have a band only in the G plus A lane, then the nucleotide is an adenine. So reading this gel from the bottom, this is the five prime end, you can see that the first band we can see is found in the G plus A lane only. This indicates that the first nucleotide in the sequence is an A, then the following bands are found in the C plus T and the C lane, and we have two bands. So this tells us the next basis in the sequence is a C and a C. And we just go through this gel until you reach the top. So in the top, you can see here that there is a band in the C plus T lane only, and this tells us that our next base in the sequence is a T. Chemical sequencing also comes with some disadvantages. It can only be used for sequencing short lengths of DNA, and it uses hazardous materials like your hydrazine and your piperidine. And this means that you need special equipment and specially trained individuals in order to perform our chemical sequencing. The next type of direct sequencing is called your dideoxy chain termination or Sanger sequencing. This is a modification of the DNA replication process. It uses single-stranded template DNA and a single-stranded primer. In this type of sequencing, a modified DNTP called dideoxynucleotide or DDNTP is used to create different lengths of DNA fragments. And the fragments are run through a gel or capillary electrophoresis in order to tell the sequence of the DNA fragment. The first step in your Sanger sequencing is the addition of the different reactants. Here are the different reactants being used. First, we have your template DNA. This will be your PCR product. Then you have your primer. So the primer binds to the three prime end of the template, and it creates copies of the template from the five prime end to the three prime end. Sometimes the primer can be conjugated with a radioactive phosphorus or a fluorescent dye as a label. Other reactants that we use are the DNTPs, just as a recap, DNTP stands for 
deoxyribonucleoside triphosphate, but we just call them DNTPs for short. These are the building blocks of our DNA whenever we do uh, amplification. Uh, we have four DNTPs, one each for adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Then in Sanger sequencing, we have these DDNTPs, which are like your regular DNTPs, but they lack the hydroxyl group found on the third ribose carbon of the deoxynucleotide. So here we have our regular DNTP and our DDNTP. And here you have the missing hydroxyl group. Whenever our DDNTPs are added to a growing sequence of DNA, this terminates the replication process. Of course, you also need the other components for DNA replication like your polymerase and other uh, substrates that it may use. The next step in Sanger sequencing is the DNA replication. So the reactions occur in four different tubes and each tube has the four DNTPs and one specific DDNTP at a lower concentration. Whenever a DDNTP is added to a growing DNA strand, the replication stops, and this results in different length strands, each ending with a specific DDNTP. In this figure, you can see our four different tubes. Again, each tube has a specific DDNTP, and all tubes have the four DNTPs, which are essential building blocks for DNA replication. It should also be noted that the ratio between DDNTPs and DNTP in each tube must be optimized. If there is too much DDNTP, then you will be left with very, very short fragments. And if there is not enough DDNTP, you will end up with very long fragments. So you need an optimized ratio of the two in order to get a variety of different fragments, which will allow you to easily sequence your DNA fragment. The last step in our Sanger sequencing is the separation of fragments and the actual sequencing. To do this, a sequencing ladder is first created. Here you can see an example of a sequencing ladder. This is still a polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, similar to our chemical sequencing. Each reaction is run on a different lane, so we have four lanes here. And since we know that each reaction contains a specific DDNTP, we can associate bands in each lane with a specific nucleotide base. So we have one for A, C, T, and G. The sequence is read based on the position and the lane of the band. So the lane in which the band can be found will tell us the base identity and the position of the band or the migration length will tell us the nucleotide sequence. So shorter fragments have a faster migration. Bands that migrate farther tell us that the nucleotide is closer to the 5' prime end where we have our primer, and the larger bands will migrate less, which tells us that these nucleotides are much farther away from our primer. So when we read this gel, for example, we read it from the bottom to the top, that is the 5' prime end to the 3' prime end. The first band we see here is found in the lane for A, so this means that the first nucleotide in our sequence is A. Here you have a G. The next in the sequence is a C, followed by another G and by a T. So you just read all of these bands until you get to the top band, which is your G. Sanger sequencing is still being widely used today, mainly because it can be adapted for automation. In an automated sequencing, instead of using radioactive dyes, we use different fluorescent dyes corresponding to each DDNTP to allow for automated reading of the sequencing ladder. There are two types of automated Sanger sequencing. First, we have dye primer sequencing. In this sequencing, the dye is attached to our primer, as the name suggests, and we have dye terminator sequencing. Here, the dye is being attached or conjugated to the DDNTP. Automated Sanger sequencing can also employ two different types of electrophoresis. First, you have the more traditional gel electrophoresis, which can either use dye primer sequencing or dye terminator sequencing, and the more popular capillary electrophoresis, which can only use dye terminator sequencing. Capillary electrophoresis is more widely used because it allows for all four sequencing reactions to be performed in the same tube. 
each band has its own corresponding fluorescent color and this is caused by the DDNTP which terminates each fragment. After the machine reads the fluorescence, it comes up with this electropherogram. Here you can see a variety of peaks and these indicate the fluorescence which was detected by your machine. Each peak is a different color of fluorescence and this corresponds to a specific nucleotide. For example, this first peak is corresponding to our G nucleotide, A, and then followed by two peaks, which correspond to two Ts. And this continues until the entire sequence is read. Now, depending on the reagents and the gels being used, the number of bases per sequence read averages from 300 to 500 bases per read. Next, we'll talk about the indirect methods for sequencing DNA. The first is pyrosequencing. Unlike your direct sequencing methods, which directly show us the different bands which correspond to the different nucleotides, pyrosequencing relies on the generation of light through luminescence whenever nucleotides are added to a growing strand of DNA. This is designed to determine a DNA sequence without having to make a sequencing ladder. Here you can see an example of a machine by Illumina, which is one of the most common machines being used for pyrosequencing. In fact, one of the common names for pyrosequencing is also called Illumina sequencing. Here you can see the different components in a pyrosequencing reaction. These include our single-stranded DNA templates, our sequencing primer, and some enzymes which include sulfurylase and luciferase, and their substrates adenosine 5-phosphosulfate or APS and luciferin. The first step in pyrosequencing is the addition of individual DNTPs. We have our template DNA, which is usually our PCR product, and this is immobilized in individual flow cells or wells. Then these wells are flooded with only one type of DNTP at a time. If the added DNTP is complementary to the template, it is added to the strand and pyrophosphate is released through this reaction. So this is your pyrophosphate. The next step in pyrosequencing is luminescence and detection. Previously, we were left with our pyrophosphate. Now, sulfurylase combines pyrophosphate and APS into ATP. Next, this ATP is used by luciferase to convert luciferin into oxyluciferin. And in this reaction also, this produces light. Now the light here is detected by our luminometer. So our nucleotides are only added one at a time to each well. And the sequence is determined by which of the four nucleotides generates a light signal. So for example, if the light signal was detected when we added a guanine DNTP, then we can tell that the next base in the sequence is guanine. If we, the light was seen when we added our cytosine DNTP, then we can tell that the next base in the sequence is your cytosine. The last step in pyrosequencing is resetting the system. Here, apyrase is used to remove excess free DNTP and DATP so that another DNTP can be added. And here you can see the reactions that apyrase does in order to remove these excess reactants. Pyrosequencing machines produce pyrograms. This is a graphical representation of what the machine was able to observe during the reaction. This consists of peaks of luminescence associated with the addition of complementary nucleotide. Here at the bottom, you can see each instance where a nucleotide was added, and whenever a luminescence was observed, you can see a peak. So for example, here when the G and the C nucleotides were added, the machine was able to observe some luminescence corresponding to this peak right here. So the machine will add G and C to the nucleotide sequence. However, when we added the T nucleotide, no luminescence was observed, so no peak is formed and the machine foregoes this nucleotide in the sequence or it skips it. Repeated nucleotides show larger luminescence peak heights. For example, here when the G nucleotide was added, a larger luminescence was observed, and this indicates that at this part of the sequence, there are two Gs, and the same can also be seen here with two Cs. Next, we have bisulfite DNA sequencing. 
This type of DNA sequencing is also known as methylation-specific sequencing, and it's used to detect methylated cytosines. These methylated cytosines are an important player in the regulation of gene expression and chromatin structure. So sometimes, although our DNA may not have any mutations, the presence of these different cytosines might still cause some genes to be downregulated or even inactivated. The first step in bisulfite DNA sequencing is bisulfite conversion. Here, DNA is fragmented and purified. Then the different fragments are denatured with heat at approximately 97 degrees for 5 minutes and exposed to a bisulfite solution. This solution is composed of sodium bisulfite, sodium hydroxide, and hydroquinone for 16 to 20 hours. What this reaction does is it converts regular cytosines into uracil. However, if those cytosines are already methylated, then this reaction will leave them unchanged. The next step is sequencing. The treated fragments are sequenced using Sanger sequencing or pyro sequencing, and the degree of methylation is determined by comparing our bisulfite treated setups with our untreated DNA fragments. Here you can see an example of a pyrogram showing you the different converted cytosines. They are denoted here by the T, which stands for your uracil. And you also have your unchanged cytosines, which are here seen as C with an underscore. Now we compare these with the untreated DNA fragments in order to find the degree of methylation. Next, we will talk about next generation sequencing or NGS. These include methods like your ion conductance sequencing, reversible dye terminator sequencing, sequencing by ligation, and nanopore sequencing. Now, what is next generation sequencing? They are also known as massive parallel sequencing techniques and they were designed in recent years to sequence large numbers of templates carrying millions of bases in a short time period. They are usually used for genomic or gene panel studies, and they have these common characteristics. First, they use target libraries, which are a collection of DNA fragments to be sequenced. Usually, these fragments may be labeled or indexed. They also need to use very powerful computers and bioinformatics to reassemble the sequenced libraries and give us information about the gene or genome of interest. The first NGS technique we will be discussing is called ion conductance sequencing. This technique uses indexed libraries, otherwise known as gene panels, and they are amplified using primers immobilized on microparticles. So here you can see a microtube containing a variety of microparticles or beads and our template DNA attaches to these beads and are amplified using ePCR or emulsion PCR. Next, these beads carrying the amplicons or our sequence templates are placed on a solid surface gene chip. Next, nucleotides are added in a predetermined order or one at a time. And when a complementary DNTP is added, a hydrogen ion is released. And you can see that in this figure right here. So aside from pyrophosphate, which was discussed in our pyro sequencing, hydrogen ions are also released whenever a new nucleotide is added to a growing sequence. The hydrogen ion will lower the pH of the reaction by a specific amount, and this is recorded by a sequencer. So whenever a change in pH is detected, whatever DNTP was added to the plate is recorded as what is next in the sequence. The next NGS technique we will be discussing is called reversible dye terminator sequencing. Here, amplified fragments are hybridized to immobilize primers on a solid surface called a flow cell. The fragments hybridize to the immobilized primers and are amplified using a special PCR called branch PCR, and this forms clusters of products called polonies. So this is what a flow cell looks like, and a microscopic look at the flow cell will show you these different primers. So we have a primer for reverse and a forward primer. So through our branch PCR, these clusters of DNA are formed called our polonies. So once these different polonies are created, they are sequenced in place by the sequential addition of fluorescently labeled nucleotides. So here you can see an example of our different polonies. 
and we add a variety of nucleotides to them. These nucleotides have a specific fluorescent label. So whenever we detect the light coming from a specific nucleotide, that nucleotide is then added to the sequence of this polony. Next, we'll talk about sequencing by ligation. Unlike the other techniques, which use individual DNTPs, sequencing by ligation uses short fluorescently labeled oligomers that hybridize in short increments if they are complementary to the DNA template. When we say oligomers, these refer to short chains of nucleic acid. Template DNA anchored to a glass slide is flooded with a fluorescent labeled oligonucleotide, and if the oligonucleotide is complementary to the template, it is ligated by DNA ligase. Using this method, two bases are detected at a time. Oligonucleotide is cleaved, followed by the next round of ligation. Each time, two new nucleotides are detected. So in this figure, you can see a graphical representation of our sequencing by ligation. Here you have our different oligomers, and each type of oligomer has a specific fluorescent probe attached. Once the oligomer attaches to the template strand, ligation is done, followed by detection. Then, cleavage of the unused oligomer so that a new oligomer can bind to the template. Lastly, we will talk about nanopore sequencing. Unlike other methods, nanopore sequencing is unique because it does not require fragmentation and amplification of the template DNA. Instead, it uses one long double-stranded DNA molecule up to one megabase pairs long. This is equivalent to one million base pairs, and this is drawn through a protein pore. Each nucleotide is identified by a disruption in the current as it passes through the pore. So here you have an example of our different protein pores, and as the DNA passes through this pore, each base pair causes a change in the current, which is then detected by your sequencer. Here you can see the different changes in the current by our different nucleotide bases. If you wanted to learn more about the things we just discussed, please check out this reference. Thank you for listening. Make sure to subscribe for more videos like this.